Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Hey guys. Uh let's learn. Ow. Neck. Um Russo Japanese War begins. All right. Port Arthur, nineteen oh four. Let's do it. Uh Kings and Generals. I just I, this is this isn't a great intro, but we're 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 learning today. That's the point. Why do I keep stuttering? I'm cold, I guess. I don't know. Let's go. Let's learn, guys. My name's Connor. If you're new, original link, top of the description. Let's go. It was a date that would live in infamy. A surprise attack upon a major port by the Imperial Japanese Navy before a formal declaration of war was made. The Admiral of the Combined Fleet would become a legend, commencing a war that would captivate naval historians worldwide ever since. Japan awoke a sleeping giant, challenging a nation many times her size and her strength. The balance of power in Asia would never be the same again. We are, of course, talking about... Jeez, Japan loves waking up sleeping giants, huh? ...surprise attack on Port Arthur. Welcome to the first episode of our new series on the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-1905. Did he say series? Oh, it's patron. Patreon. During the mid-16th century, a shaky relationship emerged between the empires of Russia and Japan, as both powers sought to expand their power and influence over an overlapping region of East Asia. During the Second Chukwa? Opium War of 1856-1860, Russia acquired the cold water port of Vladivostok from the Qing Dynasty. The treaty confirmed the cession of the entirety of what is now known as Russian Manchuria, to the Russian Empire, with Russia achieving the strategic goal of sealing off Chinese access to the Sea of Japan and getting a warm water port, right? In 1861, they attempted to establish a year-round anchorage on the island of Tsushima. This encroachment on Japanese soil led to a clash between Russian sailors and some samurai and Japanese farmers. I don't usually like stopping and reading things because it, it ruins my flow, but I think I'm good. The Russian corvette Posadnik Captain by Nikolai Birulev came to Tsushima. The Russian, Russians found two Saga domain ships, the Kenko Maru and Den, Deniru Maru, and a British warship. One farmer was killed, one samurai committed suicide, and another samurai captured by the Russians. Prompting the Japanese to ask Britain to help rid the island of the Russians. By the 1890s, Russia would go on to build the Trans-Siberian Railway, linking the empire's easternmost port of Vladivostok to the rest of Russia. This new infrastructure allowed Russia to cast her ambitions of territorial expansion onto the Qing Dynasty region of Manchuria, a territory Japan also sought. Look at this map of Asia. This is way more simple than the modern map. Man, the mid-1800s to late-1800s. It's probably like my favorite point in history to, to learn about, to be honest. Um... I don't know what it is, just the thinking about like super professional armies on these still a lot of sailing ships. You know, you're not quite into the full propeller era. Um, it's just it's I, I don't know. It makes me think of for some reason it gives me like an Indiana Jones feeling, even though that's in the in the mid 1900s and that doesn't make any sense. But that's the best way I can describe it. I don't know. During the First Sino-Japanese War of 1894-1895, Russia supported a coup in Korea, helping eliminate the Japanese-backed government in the country. Then, after winning the war against China, Japan was forced to give up her acquisition of the Liaodong Peninsula by the triple intervention of Germany, France, and Russia. Russia followed this by leasing the warm water Port Arthur in 1897 and occupying the Liaodong Peninsula for itself. Then, Russia began building the Eastern Chinese Railway and anchored its Russian Pacific fleet at Port Arthur. Japan felt cheated and viewed Russia's encroachments in Manchuria and in the Yellow Sea as a threat both to its imperial ambitions and national security. There were two Russo-Japanese wars. It really makes me want to learn more about the first one. So there were two Sino-Japanese wars and two Russo-Japanese wars. Man, China, 
was not doing great in the late... Oh, well, I mean, enormous land. So... In 1899, an insurrection erupted in China when the Society of Righteous and Harmonious Fists, known to the West as the Boxers, sought to throw off the growing Euro-colonial influence in the Middle Kingdom. During this war, the titular Boxers attacked the Chinese Eastern Railway, prompting Russia to invade Manchuria to protect its railroads and to relieve the siege of Harbin. This effectively turned Mukden into a Russian stronghold, greatly concerning the Japanese. Japan and all the other members of the Eight Nation Alliance, which had assembled to put down the boxers, called upon Russia to withdraw, and Russia gave assurances she would after the Boxer Rebellion had concluded. In April of 1902, Russia publicly agreed to a three-stage withdrawal of her Manchurian forces to occur by the end of 1903. However, Russian War Minister Kuropatkin only approved the first two stages, opposing the third on the grounds that forces were still required to guard the railways. Thus, instead of pulling out, on May 15th of 1903, Tsar Nicholas II ordered the exclusion of foreign influence from Manchuria, and Viceroy Alexeyev deployed even more forces along the Manchuria-Korea border. Japan viewed all these actions as provocative and strategically threatening. But as pointed out by statesmen like Ito Hirobumi, Japan was too weak to evict the Russians from Manchuria at the time. Japan and Britain signed the Anglo-Japanese alliance. The thing about railways that just seem so... They, they seem so vulnerable to me is that with the Russians having the base of their power thousands of miles to the west, in, you know, around Moscow and Western Russia. I mean, any incursion that goes to at any point of the railway, I'm not saying that would be easy. I mean, it's very remote areas. But, I mean, you destroy any part of the railway and the whole railway is down. Um, and so I really don't know, and it's not like you can just sail there that easily, how Russia could could wage war on this scale so effectively so far away. ...of 1902 time. Japan and Britain signed the Anglo-Japanese Alliance of 1902 as a means to thwart Russia's encroachment. Per the terms of this treaty, Britain was bound to go to war on Japan's side only if another country joined Russia in initiating a war against Japan. In both Russia and Japan, leaders were divided into hawks and doves. But it was Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany who began rattling the swords of war. Classic. Classic Wilhelm. Wilhelm. Sought to change the balance of power in Europe to Germany's benefit. Okay. And began a propaganda campaign using the Yellow Peril ideology. The Yellow Peril was a racialized fear that all of Asia would unite to enslave the West. Wilhelm perpetuated the idea that the Japanese would soon lead a pan-Asian military to invade Europe, and that only Russia could stop them. Wilhelm sent letters to his cousin, Tsar Nicholas II, proclaiming him the savior of the white race. And Jeez, so they're like saying another Mongol invasion? That God himself chose the Tsar. Not by the Mongols, obviously, but you, you know what I mean, right? Him, the, the Huns, the Mongols... Well, were the Huns even seen as, like, an Asiatic group of people? I don't know. Wilhelm sent letters. Obviously, they were in Asia, but... Or were they? Because the Urals is the cutoff. Uh, ...to his cousin, not Tsar Nicholas II, only Russia could stop them. Wilhelm sent letters to his cousin, Tsar Nicholas II, proclaiming him the savior of the white race, and that God himself chose the Tsar to defend oh, God, Europe against me. the Asian threat. In reality, the Kaiser was egging his cousin to go to war with Japan because his goal was to challenge Britain's leading position as the world's mightiest colonial empire. Britain was allied with Japan, and Germany sought a... This is why, okay... I kind of stand by my assertion that the main cause, the main perpetrator to World War I becoming World War I was Germany, okay? And I, I don't mean that, like, like it, it was, like, uh, I don't mean to, like, put down Germany in that sense. If, if you were, 
I'm, I'm not saying that was a bad thing. I'm not saying the start of World War One is a bad thing. Um, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that Germany wanting to rival the UK is not a bad thing to do. That's what any country would want to do. But I think that, as was said, saber rattling, that would I think continue for the next decade leading up to World War One, was the main reason that World War One turned into World War One. I. I think if Germany wasn't as, as like like kind of you know, stancing up, ready to fight, then maybe it could have just stayed a Balkan war, you know? But disagree if you want. Germanic alliance against her. The focus was not on Britain alone. Despite the Franco-Russian alliance of 1894, France did not support Russian expansion into Asia. In 1897, French Premier Maurice Rouvier publicly stated that the alliance applied only in Europe and not in Asia, leading Germany to believe... Is that essentially saying, we care about Germany, we don't care about Japan? ...that she might break the alliance and steal France in Asia, leading Germany to believe that she might break the alliance and steal France's place as Russia's premier continental ally. Wilhelm kept up the pressure, writing to Nicholas II. Japan is becoming a rather restless customer. It is evident in every unbiased mind that Korea must and will be Russian. This emboldened Nicholas II to believe that Germany would back them up should war occur. Russia's refusal to withdraw from Manchuria galvanized the Japanese. Several meetings between the... So is what he's saying there that Germany is saying Korea must and will be Russian? They care less about the fate of Korea and care more about just presenting themselves as being very on the Russian side and a good potential ally. IJA and IJN galvanized the Japanese. Several meetings between the IJA and IJN occurred in May of 1903, concluding that Russia's encroachment had to stop. On June 23rd, Emperor Meiji agreed that, if necessary, Japan would go to war with Russia. Statesman Ito Hirabumi strongly opposed the war and made a last-ditch effort to prevent it by proposing a deal to Russia on August 3rd of 1903, ceding Manchuria to Tsar Nicholas, if Tsar Nicholas would cede Korea to Japan. On October 3rd, Russian Foreign Minister to Japan, Roman Rosen, sent a counter-proposal. Japan would cede Manchuria to Russia. Both would mutually respect the territorial integrity of the Korean Empire, recognize Russian special interests in Korea, and make the 39th parallel a neutral buffer zone. This counter-proposal was a slap in the face. Negotiations would continue until 1904, but eventually Japan would realize Wait, so Russia was saying Korean, the Korean Peninsula and the Korean Empire would stay a thing. We'll give you parts of Manchuria, and then we'll respect each other and keep this or that? As Russia was waffling until 1904, but eventually Japan would realize Russia was waffling just to buy time to build up its Far Eastern forces. Uh-oh. Is that the, like, disastrous Russian fleet? trip that I hear about. Um, I think I saw in Blue Jay or something. Seeing increased traffic in January of 1904. Okay, so they see this as uh, just buying time. Okay. At the beginning of 1904, the Japanese military estimated that it outnumbered the Russians in the Far East by 156 infantry battalions against 100, and 106 artillery batteries against 30, though the Russians had 75 cavalry squadrons against Japan's 54. Moreover, Russia's ability to reinforce its troops was far greater than Japan's, so That's if crazy. war was to occur, the sooner the better. Right there, too. On February 1st, Field Marshal Iwao Oyama appealed to Emperor Meiji for permission to go to war, permission which was granted the very next day. The mood amongst the Japanese leadership was defiant and alarmed. If Russia was not stopped in Manchuria, Korea would be taken, threatening the very existence of the Japanese Empire itself. As a further measure before the outbreak of hostilities, the Japanese government began cultivating a relationship with American President Theodore Roosevelt hey. to ensure that, as an international mediator in world conflicts, he would weigh in their advantage at an appropriate point in the upcoming war. 
In 1904, Japan... See, I just missed that because I was reading. ...ship with M the outpin President Theodore Roosevelt to ensure that, as an international mediator in world conflicts, he would weigh in their advantage at an appropriate point in the upcoming war. In 1904, Japan's population was 46.5 million, while Russia's was 130 million. The Russian military saw the Japanese as little people who lived in paper houses and wasted hours on flower arrangement and tea ceremonies. However, when the Russian Minister of War, Kuropatkin, visited Japan in 1903, he was impressed by their infantry and artillery, stating that they were equal to any European army, and advocated avoiding war with them. Russia's navy was much larger than Japan's, but divided between the Baltic, Black and Pacific, whereas Japan's was concentrated in her home waters. By 1902, Russia began... A part of me really wishes that there was like another body of water here that connected um what is this called the aral sea right which i i think is gone now or something because of bad soviet irrigation attempts but that something about the caspian sea is just such missed potential for a lot of things if it was only connected to the black sea in a significant way i don't know i just and maybe a little bit further towards here i just think I have no reason for it. I just think it'd be cool. Okay. Um, all right. And strengthening its Pacific squadron. And by the end of 1903, had seven battleships, seven cruisers, 25 destroyers, and 27 smaller ships. The Imperial Japanese Navy consisted of six battleships, 10 cruisers, 40 destroyers, and 40 smaller vessels. But they were superior in build to their Russian counterparts. The Russian ships were a hodgepodge of but, differing types, and armaments, and speeds, with a varied amount of armor protection, while the Japanese ships were nearly all. British built and therefore more uniform and faster than their opponents. Moreover, alcoholism and a general lack of discipline amongst Russian crews was a serious problem. To further compound Russia's naval liabilities, her Baltic crews spent the six months of winter ashore because the Gulf of Finland froze over. Because of the bureaucratic demand for uniformity, Russian sailors stationed on the warmer Black Sea also spent an equal amount of months grounded. Thus, Russian sailors spent less time at sea and less time training than their Japanese counterparts. Indeed, under British instruction, the Japanese Navy spent more time at sea and trained intensively. Addition One thing I want to say, just before I forget it again, because I already forgot it, I wanted to say it earlier. I imagine the for the this Rus I guess the second Russo-Japanese War, as more of an offensive attacking war by Japan, just like wanting to fight Russia and, and take and take a important port. I, I didn't realize the amount of stress they were under by and rightfully so by Russian um incursion into these areas and their seemingly disrespect towards their towards Japan and, and stuff like that. So I, I didn't realize it was more complicated and, and kind of a defensive war for Japan Japan as much as it was offensive. Navy spent more time at sea and trained intensively. Additionally, Japanese sailors were literate, while most Russian sailors were not. The IJN combined fleet was led by Vice Admiral Heihachiro Togo. Admiral Oskar Ludwig Stark administered the two divided squadrons of the Russian Pacific Fleet. The main Russian squadron was in Port Arthur, and the other cruiser squadron was at Vladivostok, under the command of Admiral Nikolai Skridlov. On January 16th of 1904, Emperor Meiji tried a last-ditch effort for peace, sending a not verbal to Russia requesting the resumption of negotiations, but it was completely ignored. Japan officially decided on war on February 4th, and severed diplomatic relations on February 6th, 1904. The Japanese were aware that the Baltic fleet led... That Kings and Generals music means it's about to go down. That awesome, duh, I can't mimic it, but... February 6th, 1904. The Japanese were aware that the Baltic fleet, led by Admiral Zinovi Petrovich Rostetsvensky, was sailing east to reinforce the Pacific. They had to go south. Thus, they needed to destroy the divided Russian Pacific fleet before this could occur. 
The IJN chose the East Asia Squadron at Port Arthur as their first target of war, for once it was disabled, the Imperial Japanese Army would have safe passage onto mainland Asia. Japan held another advantage over the Russians, an intricate spy network run by Baron Akashi Motojiro. He was sent as a roaming military attaché all over Europe. By 1902, he moved to St. Petersburg, set up a network using locally based Japanese merchants. I would imagine being a of an Asian descent nation trying to spy in European territory, that it, just the look of you as obviously being an outsider, like not European, had to have been a very uh, a disadvantage for Japanese spying, right? I mean, you either have to... Because even if you're not as unlikely or likely to be a spy as any other European nation, just the fact that you stick out more and you're just like, that's an outsider, would have like an immediate suspicion of you, even if it's not warranted. And so I, I feel like spying for Japan and in Europe had to have been more difficult for workers compared to other nations that had a European appearance, you know? ...to St. Petersburg, set up a network using locally based Japanese merchants, workers and others sympathetic to Japan. He gathered valuable information on troop movements and naval development, and began to support Russian extremists such as Litvinov, Olovsky and Lenin to undermine Tsarist rule. It is alleged he recruited the famous spy Sidney Riley, who went to Manchuria and Port Arthur, secretly gathering intelligence, and, if it is to be believed, alongside his acquaintance Huliang Sheng, stole the Port Arthur Harbour defence plans and sold it to the IJN. Allegedly, Vice Admiral Togo was given some false information from Riley and other spies around Port Arthur about the garrison there being on full alert. This led him not to want to risk his capital ships against a well-prepared enemy. Thus, he elected to send a destroyer force to surprise attack Port Arthur. Togo, aboard his flagship Mikasa, set out on February the 6th, leading the 1st and 2nd Divisions out of Sasebo Harbour. The fleet proceeded southeast of Round Island by 6 p.m., where Togo dispatched his destroyer force into two attack squadrons, one to attack Port Arthur and the other Dalny. In anticipation of an attack, Admiral Stark had ordered two destroyers to patrol outside the harbor and provide early warning of Japanese ships approaching from the open water. Additionally, two cruisers were ordered to sweep the harbor entrance with searchlights, and all ships were to put out anti-torpedo nets and be prepared for action. However, several ships did not carry out these orders or take the situation seriously. Many main battery guns were unloaded, many nets uncast, entire crews lay asleep in hammocks, and the two patrolling destroyers were told not to fire if they saw anything, but instead to report it to the CIC. I hope the ones that were more lazy and didn't put out the nets were at least the ones more interior and not the... This was because the Tsar had instructed his Far Eastern forces, for political reasons, that if war should occur, Japan must be seen to have started it. Alongside this, the majority of the officer corps was celebrating on the shore and at a party hosted by Admiral Stark for his wife's birthday on the deck of his flagship, the Petropavlovsk. The celebrating crowd would, in fact, mistake explosions for cannon salutes for her birthday party. Using stern light, the Japanese 1st Squadron went towards Liao Ti Chan, allegedly using stolen plans from Sidney Riley to navigate through the Russian minefield protecting the harbor. At 10.50 p.m., the 1st Flotilla came across the two Russian destroyers on patrol, prompting the 1st Squadron to douse their lights and slip right past. During this process, the Japanese destroyer Oboro collided with the Ikazuchi, disabling her and blocking the path of the Inazuma. This led the flotillas to act independently, with the Inazuma becoming lost and the Oboro limping slowly. 20 minutes after midnight, the first flotilla arrived, seeing Russian searchlights. The Shirakumo fired the first two torpedoes. I feel like that's a reasonably small mistake for what could have been many more bigger mistakes, such as like uh, colliding into the minefield or Followed something, so, you know. 
Russian searchlights. The Shirakumo fired the first two torpedoes, followed by two from the Asashio. An explosion from the Palada sounded the alarm to the Russians, who began firing madly. The Kasumi then fired two torpedoes, followed by the Akatsuki likewise. The Ikazuchi, acting alone, came to the scene and fired a single torpedo as they all fled south. The third Japanese flotilla, while en route, saw lights approaching them and stopped their engines, but it turned out to be the Inazuma requesting to join them. They continued, finding the Russian ships firing in disarray. The Usugumo fired first, followed by the Shinonome and the Inazuma before they all departed south. The Sazanami had been separated from the others since 11 pm, but managed to slip past the two Russian destroyers and at 1.25 am fired a single torpedo before fleeing south. The last ship, the damaged Oboro, attempted to repair herself before creeping towards the enemy by 1.45 am, when she fired a torpedo and also departed south. On the Russian side, the Cesarevich's steering gear was hit. The Palada took a torpedo hit amidship, catching fire and keeling over, while the Retvizan took a hit below her bow waterline. The Russians were completely unprepared and could not effectively fire back, with only the Norvik giving chase to the enemy. Out of 16 torpedoes fired, only three had hit targets. Following the attack at 8 a.m., Togo dispatched Vice Admiral Dewa Shigito with four cruisers to investigate Port Arthur and, if possible, lure them out south of Encounter Rock. At 9 a.m., Dewa observed nine Russian ships getting ready to put out to sea, with three listing or run aground. The smaller vessels outside the harbor looked to be in disarray, and as Dewa approached 7,500 yards, none were firing upon him. He wireless messaged Togo that the Russians seemed paralyzed and the time was ripe to attack. Togo wanted to lure the Russians away from Port Arthur's shore batteries, but the report Togo 500 yards, none were firing upon him. He wireless messaged Togo. Okay, wireless message. I find instant communication fascinating, all right? Super game changing in warfare, but. There can be instant communication or semi-instant communication. Um, you, something can't be semi-instant, but very fast, you know, uh, on like a, a telegraph line. But what what is the difference in in um, technology that allowed them to go from allowed humans to go from like telegraph cable, like Morse code stuff, to wireless radio type? Communication, I wonder. Togo, that the Russians seemed paralyzed and the time was ripe to attack. Togo wanted to lure the Russians away from Port Arthur's shore batteries, but the report prompted him okay. to instead order an immediate attack into the heart of the harbor. Decisive. The combined Japanese fleet approached the harbor and at 11.55 a.m., within a range of 8,500 meters of the enemy, the Mikasa fired the first salvo using her forward 12-inch gun. The Russian ships and shore batteries immediately responded. After the Mikasa, the firing order was Asahi, Fuji, Yashima, Shikishima, and Hatsuse. The second and third divisions followed behind, starting a major barroom brawl and the shooting was poor on both sides. The Askold, Diana, Petropavlovsk, Poltava, and Norvik were severely damaged. After the first five minutes of dueling, the Mikasa was hit by a 10-inch shell hitting her starboard side, which ricocheted and exploded under her mainmast. Her chief engineer, staff officer, paymaster, midshipman, and three crew members were wounded, and part of her aft bridge was carried away. The Fuji received a shell through her forward casing, smashing a stack and exploding, killing a turret officer and wounding many. By 12.20, Admiral Togo realized that Dewa was incorrect in his assessment. The enemy was not paralyzed, thus he motioned the fleet to withdraw. This maneuver exposed his entire fleet to the full brunt of the Russian shore batteries. The Hatsuse, Fuji, Shikishima, and Mikasa would take the lion's share of the damage. As the fleet made its turning point, the IJN cruisers took several hits, and the Novik pursued them within 3,300 yards, prompting the IJN cruisers to launch a torpedo salvo. 
The Novik evaded the torpedoes, but took several salvos below her waterline. Togo's force made its way to Chimulpo Harbor, rendezvousing with the IJN's 4th Division, which had neutralized the harbor and landed four battalions of the IJA's 12th Division. Casualties lay at 150 Russians and 90 Japanese, with no ships sunk on either side, but many severely damaged. The Japanese were able to quickly repair their ships, while the Russians were unable to do the same with Port Arthur's limited capabilities, for they were blockaded and soon to be under siege over land and sea. Japan issued the formal declaration of war on February 8th of 1904, three hours after the surprise attack on Port Arthur. The surprise attack attracted no disapproval abroad. In fact, most Western countries' as press presented the Japanese struggle against the Russians as that of David against Goliath. Soon the bear would tumble before a rising sun. This is episode one of our member and Patreon exclusive series on the Russo-Japanese War. In total, I went by so fast. Our kind members and Patreon. I was ready for more. Dang it. Trends got nine episodes on this, this is a good topic, video, including the famous battles of the Yellow River, Mukten, Luoyang, Tsushima, and much more. Hmm? War. In total, our kind members and patrons got nine episodes on this topic, including the famous battles of the Yellow River, Mukten, Luoyang, Tsushima, and much more. Their support allows us to continue creating videos and paying living wages to our team in a YouTube space where ad revenue is extremely volatile. If you want to see the rest of the series on the Russo-Japanese War, as well as more than 160 other exclusive videos, including ones on the Spanish War of Succession, Punic Wars, Pacific War, and more, as well as get access to our exclusive Discord, see our schedule, and get early access to all videos. Join the ranks of our patrons and YouTube members via the links in the description and pinned comment. Thanks to our supporters for allowing us to continue doing our dream job. It's a great video. Um, very interesting. I've heard about this topic many times. I would like to, obviously you can see from many of my confusing questions, or me being confused asking questions, I'm not very uh, knowledgeable on the topic, but I am very aware of it, and I look forward to more videos coming out, definitely, and I will absolutely watch them. Uh, love Kings and Generals, awesome video, love you guys, hope you're all doing well, would appreciate any comments down below, any answers to any questions I had, anything at all, hope you guys are doing well, and uh, I'll see you guys next time. Bye.